we're back again. And, and here we are with Paul has been really helpful in trying to help us look at the Masjid al-Haram. Notice that the Masjid al-Haram, everything that the Quran and the tradition say about the Masjid al-Haram just makes no sense. They've got the wrong place, the wrong people, the wrong events at the wrong time. And so that's why he has scratched his head about it a number of years ago. And then you realize, hold on a minute, all these people's places, events, and the time period do not make sense in Mecca for a very good reason. It's a desert. It's There's nothing there. There is no traditions there. There is no history there. There are no empires there. There is no trade there. There is nothing. It just sits in the middle of a deserted plain and a plateau where there are few little hamlets. But this these hamlets could not have created the history that we now know today, the enormous history that the Quran is full of with all these prophets and these peoples and these places and these huge events, uh, enormous amount of history that just makes no sense so far south. However, in his, uh, in his category, it makes all the sense when you go further north. And we've said this so many times, look further north, look further north, look to where the empires exist, look where the fertile crescent is, look and see where the people are, look where the civilizations are happening, and especially, especially look to Jerusalem. And why? Because as Mel has brought up, we have brought up before, Paul has brought this up before, these people who then created Islam came out of the same environment as the Jews did. They both looked to Abraham as their antecedents. Abraham, they looked through Abraham through Ishmael, and the Jews looked to Abraham through Isaac. So they are Abrahamists, they're Ishmaelites, they're called Hagarines, they're called Mahagres, which people of the Hagar. Uh, so all these names they give to themselves shows that there is a alliance with Jews Judaism, an alliance with the Jewish scriptures, and of course, an alliance with Jerusalem. Why are we surprised by this? We shouldn't be surprised by it because take a look at the Quran, just open up the Quran and look at all the prophets. Of the 25 prophets, 19 of them are from the line of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. Fascinating. So what we're going to do today is we're going to now put another piece of the puzzle. And Paul has come and agreed. In fact, he is this is something that I've never seen this before. This is brand new, but Paul's going to introduce you. I don't think any of you have heard before, and it has to do with a beast. It has to do with a large beast. It has to do with a large animal. Uh, you all know what I'm talking about. I'm going to let Paul introduce him. Who is this beast and what's wrong with him and why can he not be in Mecca, but it makes sense for much further north. Over to you, Paul. Okay, yes, the elephant, uh, the animal we're going to be looking at today is an elephant. And we're going to be looking at Surah 105 of the Quran, which is the Surah of the Elephant. And um, we can't really imagine a, an elephant going to Mecca, but could you have uh, an elephant at Jerusalem? Yes, very much. We can and we do, if you know your Bible. Hi. Well, Surah 105 is a very short Surah of the Quran. This is it in its entirety. Um, so it's just five short verses. It says, Hast thou not seen how thy Lord dealt with the masters of the elephant? Did he not make their scheming go astray and send against them birds in swarms, pelting them with stones of baked clay, such that he made them like devoured husks? Uh, the traditional explanation for this is a rather elaborate one. Uh, it is said that King Abraha of Himya, which is more or less where, where Yemen is now, um, was uh, seeking to invade Mecca with elephants in order to destroy the Kaaba. And you see, if you see at the top of the screen there, uh, you see a, a still from a, a film of the life of Muhammad, in which it has a, a reenactment of this of this scene with all the elephants tramping across the desert, marching on Mecca. Um, as it happens, the story goes that uh, this took place in the year 570, which is referred to as the year of the elephant, and then that is actually the date that uh, the year that Muhammad was born, and Muhammad's father, Abu Mutalib. Um, is for some reason or coincidentally involved in the defense of Mecca and he's, uh, and he's evacuating people to all the hilltops around so they can all look down and uh, on what is happening below them. Uh, that is the, the official story. Um, 
Now, I don't, I don't uh, start from ridiculing religious stories because they seem to me to be unlikely. Um, it seems to me, I think I'm, I've mentioned before, that every religion, uh, Christianity included, uh, requires you to believe or expects you to believe stories that are not plausible or not, uh, I say not plausible, but not likely, un unusual. Um, there's nothing wrong with that. However, a story should make sense. Whether it's likely to have happened or not, it might be a matter of faith, but the story should make sense in itself. This story simply doesn't make sense, I, I, I don't feel. Why would a Christian king want to destroy an Abrahamic shrine? Uh, Abraham was a Christian. He didn't start off as a king. He started off as an Ethiopian general, and he uh, is perfectly historical character. Uh, he invaded Himyar and deposed the, the the Jewish king of Himyar, but he is a, a Christian. So why on earth should he take it upon himself to travel hundreds of miles across the desert uh, with the aim of destroying a shrine that, according to the uh, Islamic tradition, was a uh, built by Abraham, uh, a, a famous Abrahamic shrine and a place of pilgrimage, but also b under, under the control of the Mushrikun, of the polytheists, because they'd corrupted and they'd filled it with idols. And so why would the um, Christian king want to destroy this, this Abrahamic shrine? It doesn't really make sense. Possibly he wanted to clear out the idols, but in that case, that was no different to what Muhammad wanted to do. Why, why, why would God have sm smited him down for this? Secondly, why on earth would he need elephants? Where do the elephants come in? Um, I think there's one account that at this stage the this carver was actually made out of wood. I think there's an account that it's been made from the planks of a ship or something. But but even if it was made out of bricks or you know men men can destroy a a a, a, a building. You don't need an elephant to to tear it down. It's the most impractical. Um, it's the most impractical suggestion that you should bring in one elephant or many elephants um, to, to go and destroy a building. Plenty of simpler and easier ways of destroying a building if you've got if you've got an army, if you've got a few men around you. It's I, I'm quite happy that God can can do anything. God only has to say the word and it and it, and it will be done. But um, but for humans. Uh, and particularly in this case, the, the, the apparently the villain of the piece, Abraha, um, he, he should be bound by by common sense and what's and what's practical. How on earth could one march an elephant hundreds of miles across sandy desert uh, in order to get from Yemen to to Mecca? It it, it really beggars belief. I, I, Hannibal may have marched elephants over the, over the Alps, and other people have used elephants in different contexts, as we will see. But it's um, you, no one could no one could march an elephant into into sandy desert for hundreds of miles. It's just it just I, I don't think it makes it, it's not possible. And um, I, I think uh, Jay is Jay is going to add a map to this to this video. But it's about five hundred miles across desert. And you think of what an elephant needs to to survive, and you think of its body mass, and it will need water, and and it can, can cope with some heat. But uh, is anyone really going to? Uh, and it's five hundred miles from uh, from Sanaa to to Mecca. Is anyone going to march an elephant for something like five hundred miles across desert with no water? It just seems completely uh, to, to to beg a belief. It doesn't make any sense. Paul, and on top of that, as you can see from the picture above, which depicts that very event, we're not just talking mm -hmm. about one elephant. We're talking about a whole herd of elephants. Uh, to me, it, there's, the suggestion is you could have as many as 20 to 50, maybe 100 elephants that are doing this. And you would have to be able to water them, to feed them. As we've already said, there's no trade that goes up that route because there's no water. If there's no water, there's no fertilization. If there's no vegetation, how then do you accommodate enormous beasts of that size? Camels, yes. Camels are perfect. Why didn't they talk about camels going to do this? And why elephants? That's what's interesting. Okay, back to you. Well, yes. In fact, I think you might even struggle to get a horse 
um, to Mecca. I think in, in modern using modern technology, we, we can. But I think uh, a camel would be the way you would choose to to travel across a desert, not not a horse, and certainly certainly not an elephant. And and, and fourthly, why would God defend? The polytheists. Um, it, let us suppose there was a, a, a Christian king, and he was uh, going there with a, with a, with an elephant. Um, why why would God back the polytheists against a, a, against a monotheist? Um, it, 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 the story the story doesn't make sense before you even begin to look at the the miraculous miraculous parts of it. So. Could, what, what could the verse possibly mean then? If that's if if one were to discount the traditional explanation about Abraham and his, and his elephantine invasion, oh yeah, and another thing I might have added to this, it, it, it all just seems a bit random. Let us suppose it did happen. Let us suppose that uh, Abraham had marched his elephants to, uh, and they had been destroyed by a flock of birds with small pebbles. Um, why would the Quran tell us about it? What does it want us to know about it? It just seems like a random story. Um, it, it doesn't seem to have, it, it demonstrates God's power, but then we know God's power. What in particular does it mean? It just seems to, to stick out as, as a bit of a random uh, um, uh, story with no, with no obvious purpose within the Quran. However, um, the story is far more likely to be a reference to the Seleucids um, besieging Jerusalem in the second century BC uh, with elephants during the Maccabean revolt. And this is an episode that is reported in the in the Hebrew Bible and, of course, in the Christian Bible in the second book of Maccabees. And elephants are mentioned in five different verses or six different verses. Uh, chapter 11, verse 4 chapter 13, verse 2, and 15, chapter 14, verse 12, and chapter 15, verses 20 to 21. So to, to set the scene, uh, the, the Judea was part of the Seleucid Empire. Uh, the um, Antiochus IV, I think it is, had uh, desecrated the temple and carried out a pagan sacrifice there. Uh, Judas Maccabeus had... Uh, uh, led a revolt, a Jewish revolt, and during the course of this, um, they gained control of Jerusalem, and the Maccabeans had, and the uh, and the Seleucids had come with an army to try and retake Jerusalem, uh, led by uh, a general called Nicanor. And I've got two verses here, uh, chapter fifteen, verse twenty. Everyone now awaited the decisive moment. The enemy were already drawing near this is to Jerusalem, with their troops drawn up in battle lines, their elephants placed in strategic positions, and their cavalry stationed on the flanks. Maccabeus, contemplating the hosts before him, their elaborate equipment, and the fierceness of their elephants, stretched out his hands towards heaven and called upon the Lord who works miracles. For he knew it is not through arms, but through the Lord's decision that victory is won by those who deserve it. So if one assumes that the Quran's audience knew their Bible, which I do now assume, uh, they would read Surah 105 and they would immediately see an echo of this two Maccabeans. You've got a place um, that is being attacked by an army with elephants and you've got... Um, God being relied upon to to uh, support his his um, faithful servants. Has thou not seen how the Lord dealt with the masters of the elephant? Of course, the uh, uh, the Maccabeans were victorious in the battle. I should add that the, victor the Maccabeans were victorious in the battle, and they established a um, a Jewish state which lasted for a um, hundred years. Am I am I not right, Jay? No. Mm -hmm. Yes. This now, is when, for those people who are not, want to know the time period, this is during the intertestamental time between the fourth and the first century BC. Mm -hmm. Now, uh, a little tribute here for um, for fans of, of of Starship Troopers. If you'd like to know a little bit more about this, this isn't my idea, of course. Um, 
I read this from uh, Daniel Beck, who wrote uh, Maccabees, Not Mecca, the biblical subtext of Surat al Fil, that's the Surah of the Elephant. Now, this is available uh, for anyone to, uh, to Google or look up, and it's free online at the almusli.org website. However, I would strongly recommend anyone with a keen interest in this to buy the book, the early, uh, sorry, the evolution of the early Quran from anonymous apocalypse to charismatic prophet, because this essay is in this book, and I have I have the book here in front of me. You right now the um, now the Quran isn't isn't. Um, referring its audience to the Book of Maccabees um, just uh, completely out of any context, I, I don't think. Um, it's trying to inspire its audience by, by referring to this, uh, this episode in the past where uh, God has supported his people even though, even though their enemies were equipped with elephants. Uh, I, I would say, and uh, Daniel Beck, his, his thesis and, and I, I agree with this thesis, is that this was placed within the context of the byzantine sasanian War. Uh, now, the byzantine sasanian War was fought between 602 and 628, and these are the years when the tradition says uh, that the Quran was being composed. Now, in the early part of that war, the Sasanian Empire had been hugely successful. It had uh, seized all the Byzantine territory in the Middle East and North Africa, and this, of course, included Jerusalem itself. The Sasanians had captured these territories, and the Sasanians, who were, of course, a Persian Empire, uh, they had a, a track record of using elephants. Now, I'm not sure if they used elephants during the course of this war, but they definitely used elephants as, em as an emblem on coins or, uh, or medallions or seals, and they, uh, they would use the symbol of the elephant in order to promote their imperial grandeur and their imperial majesty. So when the um so so when the quran audience were um were hearing about the um, the companions of the elephant this is um in my view and in daniel beck's view referring back to two maccabees and giving this biblical story uh, to inspire people but it was also very pointed it was pointed at the sasanian empire and it was saying don't be afraid just because they've got elephants um, we, we beat God, God will protect you. God has defeated elephants in the past. He will defeat the, uh, the, um, the elephants, uh, the companions of the elephant in the future. It's, it's a, it is a, an excellent essay. It also goes into details about the types of elephant. I might just mention, uh, it's, uh, Daniel Beck has a little passage on how it's, uh, there's a long, a long history of humanity uh, training Asian elephants to perform various tasks, including uh, being war elephants. But there's, uh, there's almost no precedent for using African elephants in this way. He says that Asian elephants are much easier to train. African elephants is, is hardly possible to train. Uh, this is seems to be a general position, and yet. The traditional Islamic narrative would have Abraha of Himyar, who was an Ethiopian general, that would have had him getting his elephants presumably from Africa, which would have made them African elephants. Whereas, of course, the idea that this is a reference to the second book of Maccabees in order to make a pointed reference about the Sasanians during the Byzantine Sasanian War, uh, they would have been using Asian elephants. Um, the, the Seleucids, no doubt, would have been using Asian elephants too. So that, that fits as well. So, so this is a relatively, uh, a relatively small part of the overall Jerusalem thesis. By itself, the Surah of the Elephant doesn't prove that the Masjid al-Haram is Jerusalem. However, it fits. Like everything else, it, it fits. If you take, um, take the Surah of the Elephant, for 14 centuries, Muslims must have read that and thought, um, this seems a rather implausible story, but okay, I just accept it. 
but it doesn't really mean anything very much in particular. If you take the if you take Daniel Beck's thesis, it, it makes perfect sense. It's it involves matters uh, for the Quran's audience, which are very immediate and very close to them, the Sasanian capture of Jerusalem, it reassures them by reference to a biblical verse where elephants have been used in the past. It all makes perfect sense for Jerusalem. And I return back to my theme, the idea of marching elephants to Mecca simply does not, it doesn't even reach the level of, well, it's possible. It, it, I, I just don't see it as making any sense at all. Okay. Thank you. This is great. Thanks so much. Again, another piece of the puzzle that you're putting up there. Uh, it's, uh, you, you're looking back at the story of Abra Abraha, who is from Himyad, Himyad, Yemen, the south there, in 570, the year that uh, Muhammad supposedly was born. He marches with these elephants across the desert. And we're seeing, we're not just talking about one or two. We're talking about possibly as many as 50 to 100 elephants across a barren desert over 500 miles. How could you do that? Where would this, where would they? And you ask some very pertinent questions. And you, first of all, ask the question, why is it that uh, a Christian king in the South, Abyssinian king, would go and destroy a Abrahamic, uh, a, a, a Abrahamic sanctuary? That would be the first question. Secondly, where and why would he get the elephants and where did he get the elephants from? And you brought at the very end, these elephants that he would have used would have been African elephants. They do. You cannot, as we well know, I grew up in India. We had elephants all the time and African elephants are incapable of being trained. Asian, yes, but not way down in Yemen. So that doesn't make sense there historically. And also the topography doesn't make sense. Um, they wouldn't be able to cross the desert. Camels, maybe, but not elephants, because of the enormous amount of water and vegetation that you would have to take with you uh, in order to accommodate that. And then why would you, and, and this is the, probably the most important question, why would God uh, allow uh, polytheists, and well, why would he back the polytheists against the monotheist when God is a monotheist to God. That doesn't make sense either. And so you brought that up as a pertinent point. And I think that theologically speaking, that is a contradiction. Historically speaking, you, you've got a contradiction. And as far as the topography and geographically speaking, you've got a contradiction to say nothing of the animal husbandry problem. Now, you, 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 you actually go back and you show where this probably is an antecedent, the antecedent for this is the Maccabean uh, the Maccabean War, where the Seleucids are coming across, they're besieging Jerusalem. Uh, this is referred to in Second Maccabees in chapter 11, chapter 13, chapter 15, I think you said, uh, yeah, chapter 14 and chapter 50, especially verse 20 and 21 of the second. For those who don't know what we're talking about, these are the first and second, third Maccabees that are part of the, what we know as the intertestamental books. They're not part of the Bible. These are known as apocrypha writings, but they are historical. And these wars did happen uh, between the fourth and the first century BC. And you look and you say, this is, this is almost a replica of that battle, that battle, but that battle happens way up in Jerusalem. Here's the Jerusalem thesis again. This happens in Jerusalem. It is taking that battle that happened, a real battle that did happen historically, which makes sense because those would have been Asian elephants. If they're coming from the Seleucids, they would have used Asian elephants, taking that battle and redirecting and putting it down to a, uh, a reference point that happens in 570, just before the time Muhammad is born. And the Islamic traditions have borrowed, once again, something that happens much further north, in this case, a thousand miles further north. Thanks for introducing Daniel Beck to us. I've never heard his name before. This is good. I'm, uh, that book, if you could just hold it up. Yep. Yeah. Um, as I am... It You're looks in mirror writing on my screen, but it's called The Evolution of the Early Quran from Anonymous Apocalypse to Charismatic Prophet by Daniel Beck. Um, if I can say, it's, um, it was one of the first books that I bought on Islam. Um, it shouldn't have been because it's, it's not easy going. It's quite technical, very densely argued. There's a huge amount in there. Uh, for anybody who's really interested in, in, the, in the topic and anyone who really wants to understand the Quran uh, and prepared to put in some serious study, then, then it's an excellent book. It's for, its, um, for, for its material, it is one of the best books that I have that I have uh, read during the course, but I wouldn't make it my first book. If you're uh, if you're just starting out, find something a bit simpler. But it it just takes the early 
verses of the Quran, which by sorry the early what he regards as the earliest surahs of the Quran, which is I think he says from seventy four to the end, uh, seventy four upwards, uh, excluding one or two, and, uh, and and he goes through it and he shows how uh, how his main theme is that it's a, a lot of it is based around the Sasanian War, and he so he says for example that uh, Abu Lahab, the father of the flame is uh, is Khosro, and he argues that the blind man who uh, who Muhammad or, or the blind man who uh, who somebody frowns and turns away from he suggests that that's Khosro's father it, it, it's a really excellent book but not but not a starter book don't do what I did and buy it first you never read anything else so the warning is out be careful what you read it, it <laughs> may, may blow your mind it may also it may give you a window into an awful lot of historical possibilities <laughs> all Thank you so much for unpacking what Daniel has done so, uh, so uh, historically. You brought it to the public fear, and we're getting it out there so people can hear it. God bless you. Thanks for coming on board. The next thing we're going to talk about is the name Mahmoud. Am I correct? Yes. Well, that'll That's be our next one, yes. So stay tuned. This is Jay here in the United States and all here in London. Over and out. Over and out.